In this series, I'm building an Apple IIe computer, but instead of using a 6502 microprocessor, I'll be using a homebrew CPU made out of TTL parts. It's loosely based on the SAP-1, which was designed by Albert Paul Malvino and popularized by Ben Eater. Here, the new CPU is operating in slow mode, being clocked by the Arduino. The Arduino snoops on the address and data buses, and when it sees a memory access that looks like a pixel write, it sends the data back to the host PC, which then displays it on the screen. Eventually, the Arduino will just be used for the keyboard interface and to emulate a pair of floppy disk drives. The debug is a little bit ahead of the build at the moment, and normally I would have delayed this sort of image because it's a bit more dramatic to show it later, but I know there are a lot of CPU projects on YouTube that never get finished. So I wanted to offer a proof of life. If you're going to invest the time to watch a video series, you should have at least some assurance that I'll finish the project at some point. On the left, we have the SAP 6502 prototype, which I covered in great detail in this video series. I'll provide a link to the playlist below. But now I'm going to migrate the design over to printed circuit boards and try to turn it into a usable machine like an Apple IIe. Once it's fully debugged, I'll make it into a single printed circuit board, which I'll make available in various forms. In the last video, I went over the sequencer. But in this video, I'm going to go over the program counter, main memory, and register bank. Next video will be the ALU and status register. Interestingly, the status register is larger than the ALU. After that, we have the graphic system, and then I'll have a couple of surprise videos which I'm going to keep up my sleeve for now. Back to the original SAP 6502 build, the next part of the design I'm going to look at are these Octal D type flip flops down the center. This is the register bank, and we have the W bus running underneath it. At the moment, the register bank consists of a large number of Octal D type flip flops, with both the inputs and outputs connected to the W bus. There's a single chip for the X register, Y register, accumulator, and both of the effective address B registers. One advantage of this design is that I can drive the output of one register while clocking the data into the input of another. This lets me transfer data between the registers in the register bank in one clock cycle. Now it turns out I don't actually do this very often in the microcode. Usually the data goes somewhere else, such as the program counter or the ALU. Provided I'm willing to live with the restriction that I can only read from one of these registers or write to one of these registers in any given clock cycle, then I can replace all of these registers with a single static RAM chip. So that's what I'm going to do. You might be wondering about instructions like transfer A to X. Surely this must benefit from direct register to register transfers. But if we look carefully, we can see that even this instruction can update the negative and zero flags. So in this design at least, that means that the data has to go through the ALU. The other part of the design that I want to integrate into this current printed circuit board is the main memory here, which is a static RAM and an EEPROM. When finished, this board should have three memories on it, the register bank, the Apple II RAM, and the Apple II ROM. I'm going to use a 27C4001 as our main EEPROM, which stores the Apple II BIOS, a 628128 static RAM, which will be our Apple II main memory, and then I'm going to use the second 628128 for our register store. We only need less than a dozen bytes out of the 128K, so yes, I'll agree that it's a bit wasteful, but really it's no different than storing a 10 meg PDF on a 128 gig thumb drive. Connect up the address lines and the data lines to each chip. All of these chips will share a data bus, which is actually an extension of our main W bus in the system. The main memory EEPROM and static RAM will have a common address bus, while the register bank static RAM has its own addressing inputs. Although I really only need four address lines for the register bank, I think I'll hook up eight just in case I need them later. The upper nine address lines are just grounded. Just as I did with the sequencer, I'm planning to have a separate connector for the address bus and the data bus, and I'll also use this for the notepad addresses as well. Wire up all the buses, label the control signals and run them to the connector as well. If you want to have a look at the schematic at your own pace, it's available at GitHub. 
I've manually laid out the parts on the board and I do the routing with the free routing software. Once that's done, where I can, I sometimes go in and make the power signals a bit wider. This is KiCad's prediction for what the board will look like. And here's the actual board. In the overall scheme of the build, it's located here in the center. The next part of the design I'm going to go over is the program counter and the effective address A registers. I need a 16-bit program counter, but it's really going to be made up of two 8-bit functional units. It's described in a lot more detail in part 5 of the SAP6502 series, but I'll briefly revise the highlights here so it makes the schematic design more understandable. Originally, I had the memory connected to the W bus through a 74HC245IC, which is a bidirectional buffer, but all the memory chips have output enabled signals on them, so I don't really need this anymore. I should be able to hook up the data lines directly to the W bus. Now I need some chips to implement the program counter, which is 16 bits wide, but functionally, in the microcode, I treat them as two 8 bit registers PC low and PC high. What I need these registers to be able to do is either load a value or increment the value that's currently stored in them. It turns out the 74HC161 counter is ideal for this, but they only store 4 bits each. This means I'll need a total of 4 of them to implement a 16 bit program counter. But I want the program counter or the effective address A registers to be able to drive the address lines on the memory chips directly. This means I'll need to put a 74HC245 between the program counter and the address lines. One of the things that makes the 6502 so powerful is its multitude of addressing modes. We need the effective address registers to help us calculate the address of the data associated with a given instruction, while maintaining the current value in the program counter. So this is why the effective address A low and effective address A high registers interface between the W bus and the memory address pins. We need to be able to access the contents of the program counter for branch instructions, and we need to be able to read the value in the effective address register for some of the more complex addressing modes. So we have these 74HC245s, which can drive the value on the address bus back to the W bus to be read by the microcode. Now, what I've hoped you've noticed is that these circuits for the lower 8 bits and the upper 8 bits are identical. This means I should be able to have one design which I can replicate and it'll act as a full 16 bit program counter. I go back to KiCad and lay down a single 74HC161, connect up all the input and output pins, add control signals. Remember that each 74HC161 only stores 4 bits. So I need to replicate this to form an 8-bit program counter on a single board. The input comes from the W bus, and the outputs form a temporary bus I've called T. So we have T0 through T7. I connect this T bus to a 74HC245 as per our previous block diagram. Connect up some wires to the inputs and outputs. Replicate it for the feedback circuit. And I'll use this as a placeholder for our 8-bit effective address register. Now that all the main chips have been laid down, I need to wire up the buses. I add a pin header, which is for the address bus and some control signals. But again, don't worry if I'm going over this too quickly. The schematics will be available through GitHub. I've manually laid down the position of all the chips and headers on the board, and I'll do the routing with the free routing software. Add power and ground planes. This is KiCad's rendering of the board. Again, the pin headers will be placed pointing down rather than up. I've decided to go with this hybrid approach of using printed circuit boards on some perf board for this machine. This is much easier to debug compared to a multi-layer PC board. Making a bodge to an error that occurs on one of the inner layers can become almost impossible. On the underside, I need to manually hand wire the connection between these boards. On the upper left, we have the main memory and register bank. Next, we have program counter low and program counter high. On the lower right hand side of the board, we can see the Arduino Mega. We have some LEDs, and we have this circuit that detects memory access to location C1000. The red wires are the W bus, and the blue wires are the address bus. 
I'm not going to go over every single bug, but I will mention the important ones. The control word for this machine is 64 bits wide, and I encountered a problem with the design that I didn't have in the SAP 6502, and I think that's because I swapped the SRAM to faster 50 nanosecond parts in this machine. First, let's have a look at the output from the control word flip flops. Right bar, data, PC select, and EA select all become active at once. If we look at the design though, PC select and EA select control the outputs for a 74HC245 and a 74HC374 respectively. This means there will be a propagation delay before the address lines are updated, which may be as high as 25 nanoseconds. Even though this is quite a bit less than 50 nanoseconds, at least some writes were occurring to the wrong location. I solved this in the short term by using the Arduino to delay the write bar signal, but I'll solve this in the microcode by making sure that PC select or EA select are updated one clock before the write signal. I'll update this next time I burn some EEPROMs. Well, that's it for this video. Hopefully you've already watched the SAP 6502 series, and if you haven't, I'd encourage you to watch the Turing 6502 series as well. I'll see you in the next video where we'll look at ALU and status.